السلام عليك زين الأنبياء السلام عليك الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدان الله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد مفتاح باب رحمة الله عدل ما في علم الله صراة والسلام من دائمين بدوام منك الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وشهد أنه الله الذي لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله واحد ورب شاهد ونحن ونحن له مسلمون وشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وكرة عيوننا محمد عبد رسوله أرسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهر على دين كله ولو كره المشركون ما بعد يا عباد الله نموسيكم ونفس إياي بتقوى الله When we speak and discuss the importance When we speak about and discuss the importance of taqwa One of the most important aspects of taqwa Is that you and I understand the niyyah or the intention And the hope is by now that all of us have come to understand something of the importance of the intention. Ultimately, where you and I will be eternally in one of the two final abodes, we'll get back to how it is that we intend here in this world. But today, we wanted to take a little bit of a closer look at the reality of the intention and touch as well upon some of its dimensions. The intention stems from a trilateral root, nawa, yanwi, nawa. So the Arab would say, nawa al-musafir, ay taba'id. The traveler started traveling and be- became distant. Or you would also say, nawa rajul as-safar. A man intended a travel. A qasad wa azamale. That he desired to do so and had resolution to set out. And so the verbal down an nawa means a bu'd, it means distance. Just as it indicates the direction that someone is traveling. So when we speak about the intention lexically, it relates to the direction we take on a journey just as it relates to the place to which one purposes journey. And this is why it is so important for you and I because all of us in reality are traveling. Even if we be at home, we are all traveling. Traveling ultimately back to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the greatest journey of all and the most important journey for us to take provision for. This is in relation to the Arabic language. And then if we look at what the scholars have said about the intention, the reality of the intention is what motivates us at the depth of our being. They refer to this as the inbi'ath nafs what literally the soul is dispatched to do. What are we intending, i.e., what motivates us to do what it is that we do. And also, to a juha, that how do we direct our heart, i.e., the intentions that arise within our heart. And what is our male? What are our inclinations? So the intention relates to motivation. It relates to direction of heart. And it relates to what we incline towards. And one of the important things here for us to understand is that this is why knowledge is so important because you are not going to set out on any journey in the world if you don't have knowledge of the place that you are going. If you've never heard once in your life that there is a place called China, it is impossible for you to ever intend to intend to go there because you've never heard of the name. It is a prerequisite for intending something that you have knowledge of that thing. And this is why knowledge is where we begin. 
And this is why it is so important to sit before the inheritors of the Prophet وسلم, and to learn our deen. Because the more that we learn our deen, the more that we know what it is that we should intend. And then once we know that, then there's a process of purification that takes place when we're doing what it is that we're supposed to be doing, even if we don't attain the higher degrees of sincerity right away. So there are a lot of different terms in Arabic that relate to the intention. Niya is one of them. Irada is one of them. Qast is one of them. Your hem or even your himma is one of them. A hajis that comes to your heart, it relates to the intention as well. Azam, all of these different terms, they have slightly different meanings, but in reality, in the most general sense, they're synonyms. They all relate to this internal dimension of the human being. How it is that we're directing our hearts, what motivates us to do what it is that we do, and what does our heart incline towards. And it is for this reason that the great scholar Habib Ahmed bin Zayn al-Habshi, radiallahu anhu, he said, "Aniyatu ruh al-amal." The intention is the spirit of action. And just as your physical body has no life, no animate life, if your soul departs, if your spirit departs, likewise, any amal, any righteous deed that we do has no reality without the intention. So he said it's also karruhi lil jasam. It's also like the spirit to the body. And it is like rain to the earth. These different metaphors that indicate life. And so what he's saying here is the intention is the life of the action that is that we're doing. This is the way that it can truly be done for his sake, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it is important for us then to look at some of the various dimensions of the intention. And today we wanted to focus primarily on three. And the fourth is relates to its fruit. But the first three are the ones that we can work on. The first dimension of the intention is what is called ikhlas and niya, sincerity of intention. And the very easy definition of sincerity is for you and I to seek nothing other than Allah and closeness to Him and everything that it is that we do. And that sounds simple, and in principle it is, by way of definition. But because that we've been made up of not only a spirit and a heart, but we also have a nafs. And the nature of this nafs, translated here in its negative sense, our ego, our lower self, is that it drags us down. It likes to indulge in the various pleasures that arise within it. And oftentimes it tries to misdirect us and misguide us. So this is part of the human struggle, is digging down deep within ourselves and striving to be sincere, even though we have an aspect of ourselves that is pulling us towards insincerity. And this is why sincerity is not something usually that we can attain overnight. It's a process. It's a process and it takes time. And this is indicated in the words of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَنْ أَخْلَصَ لِلَّهِ أَرْبَعِينَ صَبَاحٍ Whoever is sincere to Allah for 40 straight days, تَفَجَّرَتْ يَنَابِيِ الْحِكْمَةِ مِنْ قَلْبِهَا لِلِسَانَةِ The springs of wisdom will pour forth from his heart onto his tongue. But the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned 40 straight days means that this is something that requires work. It's something that you and I that have to take very seriously and strive over an extended period of time to have it realized within us. But this is the essence of the deen. It's just being sincere. They've only been commanded to be sincere to Allah, being sincere in religion. This, this is the only thing that they've been commanded to do ultimately. Religion is only nasiha. Religion in reality is only sincere, sincerity. 
And then the way that translates into that your brothers and so forth might be that you want good for them and direct them in the right way. But ultimately it relates to this trait of ikhlas. Sincerity with Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So ikhlas and niyyah, sincerity of intention. And to repeat, sincerity is defined as desiring only closeness to Allah and everything that it is that you do. So there will be various pulls that relate to all of the different actions that we do. We're pulled in this direction to be praised by people. We're pulled in this direction to be noticed by people. We're pulled in this direction to do it because we want something in return. Various ulterior motives. And all of these ulterior motives relate to the hawa, desire. And the hawa is the ghida of the anfus. The various passions and caprice are the sustenance of the lower self. And so why is it so hard to do actions solely for the sake of Allah wa ta'ala? Because you're putting your hawa aside. And if you are trying to drive a car without fuel in the tank, that obviously the car is not going to go anywhere. This is one of the reasons why doing things sincerely for the sake of Allah is so hard. Because that you don't feel that assistance from the nafs in it. But those are perhaps some of the greatest actions that not only pierce veils, that are some of the most hopeful actions for us to receive forgiveness by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing the things that you really don't want to do, but you know you have to or you should do. And if we can train ourselves to get used to it, then the nafs starts to transform, where it will actually start to take pleasure in doing things solely for the sake of Allah Ta'ala because Allah Ta'ala will replace that nafsi type feel with a more beautiful feel that originates in the heart and that He'll give you a sweetness of faith. And then you'll want to only solely do it, only do it for His sake, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and you will find this other aspect of the nafs repulsive because you realize that it's lowly. But again, this takes time to go through a process of purification desiring only closeness to Allah. And when, if you watch over the heart, you will see the pull. You will see the pull towards things of this world of various types, whether it be wealth or status or whatever it might be. And this is why the scholars have spoken about various signs of sincerity for various acts that we do. For instance, they mention in terms of seeking sacred knowledge, the sign that someone is sincere in seeking sacred knowledge is that you imagine that you're going to die tomorrow. You imagine that tomorrow you're going to die. And then you look at your heart. The knowledge that you were supposed to be seeking that day, the class that you were supposed to be intending that day, do you feel motivated still to intend that class or to that read that book or do whatever it is that you had set out to do on that day? If you still have the motivation, it's a sign that you're sincere. If you don't, it's a sign that you wanted something worldly from your knowledge because with the loss of life, you no longer have that desire. So if there's no longer desire to study, it's a sign that we need to work on our sincerity. Whereas the sincere person realizes that even if I'm going to die tomorrow and I'm not going to finish that book or achieve what I wanted to achieve, but I know dying, seeking sacred knowledge is one of the most blessed things and beloved things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, is that he's one of the categories of those who receive the reward of a martyr if they die in the way, its way. Anyone who's set on a path to secret, seek sacred knowledge and Allah Taala that it takes their life, they get the reward of a martyr from the blessing of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala because he's fi sabilillah, he's in the path of Allah. Another example is that they mention if someone that builds an institution, whether it be a masjid or whether it be a school, to what degree do we want our name to be on that plaque of that building? To what degree do we want to be known that we are the ones that actually did that particular act. They mentioned a beautiful story where there was a man building a mosque in a particular place and he actually had a wakil, an agent who was doing it for him. And so it became known in that particular city that the agent was the one actually building the mosque. And then he comes back to the man who was really funding it and he says, people think that I'm the one building it in this particular area. And he said, the one that I built it for 
knows for whom I built it. Meaning that I'm not in need of people knowing whether I built it or not. And the foundation is we actually try to hide our good deeds unless it's inevitable or unless there's a sound reason for us to do it in front of people. Sincerity. And there's many other examples. And in fact, all the different things that we do, there's a sign associated with the doing of that particular deed to determine whether or not we are sincere. And so this is what we want to do. We want to revive sincerity in our hearts because this is the first stage. And so intention goes hand in hand with sincerity. And it is conceivable that someone makes an intention that is insincere. But the prerequisite for the acceptance of any deed is that we do it solely for Allah Taala's sake. And then the scholars go into great detail in the most advanced books. What if we have multiple motivations? Imam Ghazali treats this in the Ihya al On any given act, let's say that we're 70% sincere and 30% insincere. What happens? Is it completely rejected? And Imam Ghazali says the hope from the bounty of Allah is that our reward for that act will only diminish to the degree of our insincerity. So in other words, we subtract that 30% from the reward. And let's say it's flipped around, that we're only 30% sincere and we're only and we're 70% insincere. That's a dangerous state to be in because now it hasn't just canceled it out. You're more in the direction of insincerity, but it's not as serious as being 90% insincere and 10% sincere. So we should strive to be sincere in what it is that we do and come to be in tune with the various thoughts that come to our heart and then to watch very carefully and to see in which direction are we being pulled. And Imam Abdullah bin al Haddad has very blessed intentions that we can make when we learn, when we are teaching, when we are attending gatherings. That many of you know them. That starts in a way to ta'allim wa ta'aleem wa nafa' wa nantifa' wa tadhakkar wa tadkir wa ifada wa istifada until the end of the blessed intentions. Teaching us how it is that we can intend. And this is very good for us to memorize these intentions and to repeat them regularly so that we can taste something of their reality. The next dimension of the intention is what is called tosi'aniya, expanding our intentions. So not only are we sincere, we also want to expand our intentions and to make multiple intentions for any given act. And from here, we can understand the blessed statement of the great Imam Abdullah ibn Ibn Mubarak, where he said, Rubba amalin saghir tu that how many a small act is deemed to be great by virtue of the intention or intentions that was or were made behind it. And how many great actions are actually deemed to be small because of the intention that was made behind them. So learning to make multiple intentions for everything that it is that we do. And one example of that can be is the niyat tatayyub, when we wear perfume. What intentions do we make? The first intention that we should make is to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's a hadith in Abdul Razak, the collection of Abdul Razak that says, مَنْ تَطَيِّبَ لِلَّهِ جَاءَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَرِيْهُ أَطْيَبْ مِنْ المسك. Whoever wears perfume for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will come on the day of judgment and smell better than musk. وَمَنْ تَطَيِّبَ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ جَاءَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَرِيْهُ أَنْتًا مِنْ الْجِيفَ and whoever puts on perfume for other than the sake of Allah, he will come on the day of judgment and his smell will be more putrid than a corpse. So the first intention is ittiba'a sunnah. We are doing this to follow our Prophet wasallam, And then the intentions that we make for every action, drawing near to Allah, seeking his contentment, wanting to get reward for it, being entered into paradise to attain a gaze upon his noble countenance. We make those intentions for everything that is that we do and then we add some. So that you can actually that bring about a good feeling for the one who's sitting with you by smelling good. Eventually you get used to it, but it's pleasant for them. That it's a way of respecting places that should be respected. 
when you go to a masjid, a mosque, when you go to a learning center, when you go to visit someone, these are times that we should be showing respect. And by making that intention to perf perfume, perfume yourself, you're respecting that place and having adab. And that you can also make the intention to that ward off that any bad odors that might emanate from you, emit, that you might emit, that you would then harm someone, and so forth and so on. And Imam Shafi even mentions one where he says, taqwiyat al damagh One of the intentions that we can make is that by wearing perfume, Imam Shafi said that it actually strengthens your mind to wear perfume. And he's a statement where he says, من طاب ريح زاد عقله Whoever smells good, their intellect will be strengthened. And then the last aspect that we will cover for today is what is called mulazamat al And I want to remind ourselves of that chapter heading of that very blessed book, one of the first chapter headings in that very blessed book of Imam al nawawi uh, his book of Adhkar, where he titles it, Bab al-Ikhlas wa Ihdar al the chapter on sincerity and making intentions, fi jami'ir a'mal wal aqwal, in all of our actions and things that we say, wal ahwal, in all of our states, al bariza wal khafiya, outwardly and inwardly. And one of the scholars said that indeed that I love to make a good intention in everything that it is that I do, even when I eat and when I drink. And as the, the poet said, kun mutahriyan, be very careful to make righteous intentions. Mustakthiran, make them abundantly, make many of them. Waraqib wakshai, wuksakthiran minha waraqib wakshai, and then watch carefully over your heart and to be in a state of awe of your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learning to make multiple intentions and learning to make intentions in everything that it is that we do. And it is possible for the believer that your whole life becomes worship from morning until evening. If you learn how to make the intention by everything that it is that you do, from the time that you wake up in the morning, from using the restroom to purifying yourself, to praying for your Lord, to wearing your clothes, to working, to spending time with your family, and all of the other things that we do in our day. How many times do we that, that fail to receive reward because we forget an intention? Let's learn how to make intentions behind everything that is that we do, and that this way, permissible things actually then become sometimes recommended and sometimes a permissible thing can even become an obligation with the right intention and the classical example is that is it's not permissible to starve yourself so you have to eat to fulfill the right of your body were you to starve yourself intentionally it's haram that is unlawful so by eating with that intention you get the reward for an obligation and then if you also intend to strengthen yourself for worship you get reward for tasting good food from the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we can apply this to everything else that it is that we do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and open the doors of His mercy to all of us. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولي جميع المسلمين فاستغفروه فإنه غفور الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين والصحابة الأكرمين وتابعين لهم بأحسان إلى يوم الدين وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين إن يا عباد الله إن يا عباد الله اتقوا الله إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد ورضي الله تعالى عن ساداتنا الخلفاء الرشيدين أبي بكر وعمر وثمان وعلي وجميع سادات الصحابة الكرام وأهل بيت الرسول الله المطهرين من الأرجاس وعلينا معهم فيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات 
We ask our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us to be sincere in all of our affairs. Ya Arhamur Rahmi, may Allah ta'ala wa ta'ala purify our hearts and bless our hearts to be solely for Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala give us insight into our faults and to purify us of all blemishes and all faults. Ya Arhamur Rahmin. May Allah ta'ala wa ta'ala bless us to be able to intend like the righteous intent. Ya Arhamur Rahmin. And may we receive the benefits and the blessings of those intentions all throughout our life. Ya Arhamur Rahmin. Most importantly, when we take our last breath and we transition from this world into the next till we meet you. Ya Arhamur Rahmin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make everything easy for us and for the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad and to alleviate all of our suffering the suffering of Ummah Sayyidina Muhammad. May Allah Ta'ala remove all of our calamities and the calamities of Ummah Sayyidina Muhammad. May Allah Ta'ala to make easy everything Ya Alhamdulillah Rahmin for us and for the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad and return to us and return us unto him in the very best of states Ya Alhamdulillah Rahmin. May we learn the meanings of fleeing to him Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in all of our different states. Awakum Allah, Nasrukum Allah, Inna Allah Ya'mur Bar'adil Ihsani Wa Ita'id Al-Qurba وإنهاء الفحشاء والمنكر البغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروا عنهم يزدكم ونذكر الله أكبر <تصفيق>